Mankind has denoted money in many shapes and forms. He has used seashells, stones, chocolate, salt, metal coins, a piece of paper, and now we are using a string of code which is electronically mined by a computer. While it's still in its infancy, virtual currency is on the rise and now contributes about 0.5% to the total global value of money, which is currently estimated to be around $420 trillion. And so in this video, we shall look to answer some of the more pressing questions around mankind's newest currency as we peek into this cryptic world of cryptocurrencies. Let's begin. A cryptocurrency is a digital or virtual currency which is designed to work as a medium of exchange through a computer network that is not reliant on any central authority like a government or a bank. Now this last part is really important because for many centuries the responsibility and control of issuing currencies was on governments and central banks. But in the case of a cryptocurrency, this entire process of issuing, storage and accounting is completely decentralized and is entirely self-managed by thousands and millions of computers that run on free open source software that is powered by blockchain technology. Now this may be sounding a bit complicated to you, but we'll definitely simplify this in further sections of this video. But the point is cryptocurrencies do satisfy the three essential properties of money. That is, it is a medium of exchange, it's a unit of measurement, and cryptocurrencies are a storehouse of wealth. Before we answer this, let's quickly look at how a banking transaction works. So say you want to transfer some money to a friend. You'll go to a bank or the bank's website, you'll make a transfer request, the instruction will reach your bank's main servers, then the bank will verify if your account has sufficient funds and if yes, they'll authorize and execute that transaction. Now in the case of cryptocurrencies, this process starts and revolves around the word decentralized, which means instead of having an account for every user like we have in a bank, every transaction of a given cryptocurrency is all recorded on the same giant ledger. And not only that, there are many, many copies of that ledger and anyone who's a part of that cryptocurrency network would have a copy of that ledger. So when you go to a store and let's say you spend 300 rupees or 0.0001 bitcoins on a pizza, then instead of checking with some centralized bank type record keeper, the Bitcoin system would independently check with every single and sufficiently large number of computers to verify if you actually have these bitcoins and if the transaction you're doing is actually valid. Sounds too simple, doesn't it? So let's detail it out a little more. Every time someone pays for something with bitcoin, that transaction is recorded as a block. Now each block contains transaction data like who was paid, how much was paid. It also has a hash which is a unique identifier and the transaction line also contains the hash of the previous block in the sequence or the last recorded transaction. So this entire blockchain system rests on the concept that if something is changed in a block, then that block's hash will also change. I mean, think of it like your bank's OTP, which changes every time you do a fresh transaction, which is definitely safer than using a net banking password that you change once in a while or sometimes never change in many years. Going back to the blocks, so each block also contains the data of the previous block and if the hash of the block here changes, then the next block will no longer have a matching hash with it and therefore every subsequent block after that becomes an invalid one. Now if you picture this around a few million users on the Bitcoin network, if someone wanted to fraudulently create a transaction that pays oneself money or coins, then he or she will not just have to tamper with a block and every single block after it, but will have to do this on millions of computers all around the world. This is a massive jump in securing transactions as compared to now, where entering into an account is as simple as hacking one's net banking password or guessing one's mobile banking four digit pin. So to close the transaction loop, once the million plus computers check and verify the authenticity of the transaction, the details are then updated on every computer's blockchain records. 
I hope now everyone can see why people are so excited about blockchain as a technology and how it can transform record keeping across different fields like insurance, uh, land records, social security, health identifiers, etc. Unlike currency notes and coins that are minted by central banks, a cryptocurrency is created by computer code. Which means in theory anyone can create their own cryptocurrency using blockchain and that's why there are over 6500 cryptocurrencies in existence today. The creation of new coins is called mining which requires the miner to do small but complex algorithmic jobs like verification, matching of transactions or solving a mathematical puzzle. Once this task is successfully completed, the accomplisher is rewarded with an appropriate amount of currency. Now while this process might sound easy on paper, these tasks or calculations are pretty complicated and requires a lot of computing power to solve, which therefore requires a lot of energy. In fact, per one estimate, almost 0.3% of the world's electricity currently goes towards powering these cryptocurrency mining computers. Of the 6,500 or so cryptocurrencies in existence, only a handful are popular and accepted. These would include currencies like Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin, etc. And what's interesting here is that each of these coins have some different properties and characteristics. For instance, Ethereum, which is the second most invested crypto, can process transactions a lot faster than the more popular Bitcoin. Likewise, coins like Cardano and Litecoin are considered to be more technologically superior than Bitcoins and even Ethereum. As a matter of fact, private organizations and individuals can freely create their own currencies and rumors are rife that Meta and Amazon might launch their own crypto sometime this year. Of course, I should point out that there is still little or no clarity on the acceptance of these as legal tender in many countries. And while I have named some coins in this video, none of this should be construed as an endorsement for any coin of a cryptocurrency as an asset class. In our view, cryptos are too new an asset class for us to stake an opinion on, but we'll continue to collect and relay information on them in this YouTube channel, so do consider subscribing it and tapping the bell icon for notification alerts. There are typically two major choice of platforms that one needs to make here. So you can either use a traditional broker or buy through a dedicated cryptocurrency exchange. A broker is someone like Robinhood, Charles Schwab's or Coinbase which allows users to trade in cryptocurrency as well as other financial assets like stocks, bonds and ETFs. Generally these platforms tend to offer lower trading costs but they also have fewer crypto features. Cryptocurrency exchanges on the other hand offer different types of cryptocurrencies and tons of features like wallet storage options, interest bearing account options, margin trading, educational content etc. So an Indian example of a cryptocurrency exchange would include CoinDCX, Wazirx, CoinSwitch, Kubeer etc. Now in addition to brokers and crypto exchanges, there are a few more ways in which one can invest in cryptos. For instance, one can invest via payment services like PayPal and Venmo abroad. But in India, there is still some confusion with a recent news report that says that RBI is stalling the payment aggregator license applications of some fintechs who have dealings with cryptocurrency exchanges. Yet another way of investing in cryptos is by buying into Bitcoin or blockchain mutual funds and ETFs. While these instruments are sporadically showing up in different countries around the world, but with no consensus and clarity from governments, these are still facing some problems. Like in the case of India, this ball got rolling with Invesco Mutual Funds application to launch a crypto-based ETF fund of fund scheme, which was shut down by the Securities and Exchange Board of India, citing the absence of a regulatory framework for cryptos. More recently, Aditya Birla Sun Life has filed for a blockchain and virtual digital assets ETF fund of fund, which includes investing in virtual digital assets like cryptos and NFTs. So there is bound to be some continued action on this front and investing via mutual funds and exchange traded funds can be a viable method for buying cryptos for interested investors.
Cryptocurrencies are relatively new investment instruments with a history of 12 to 13 years, which means making sense of their performance is a bit difficult, at least for me. For instance, Bitcoin has delivered analyzed returns of almost 100% over the last decade, which can in all practical sense be labeled as speculative given the fact that we are dealing with an unknown yet potentially promising instrument. Having said this, what one should expect from cryptocurrencies are periods of extreme volatility with the price of that asset losing almost half of its value between May and July of 2021 and again between November of 2021 and January of 2022. In fact, just two years back, Bitcoin investors experienced its worst one week period between the 6th of March and the 13th of March in 2020 when the currency lost 42% of its value. Now the question is, where does this volatility come from? The first factor is of course the demand and supply of cryptocurrency and any mismatch of it is promptly reflected in the price of the asset. Bitcoin's market value is primarily affected by how many coins are in circulation and how much people are willing to pay for it. Now by design, the number of Bitcoins are limited to 21 million and the closer the circulating supply gets to this limit, the prices are likely to climb even higher. In fact, almost 19 million Bitcoins have already been mined and it's actually the scarcity factor that is getting individuals, HNIs, companies and even university endowment funds to own cryptos. Beyond demand and supply, some other factors that play a part in price determination include the growing interest among mutual funds and ETFs and by consequence retail investors, news outlets and social media influencers who hype cryptos as the key to massive wealth building, and on the negative side, the potential consequences of Bitcoin regulations and taxation. There is no denying that Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies are still in their infancy, unlike physical currencies, gold, real estate and equities, which have been around for many centuries. In our opinion, cryptos are still in a price discovery phase and all investors existing and future will need to work through moments of delight and despair when working with these instruments. In the 2022 Union Budget, Finance Minister Nirmala Sitharaman introduced a tax on all gains arising from the sale of virtual digital assets, including cryptocurrencies. Now, India is neither the first nor the only country to tax cryptocurrency transactions. Countries like the United States, the United Kingdom, Italy, Netherlands and Canada all have a crypto tax which ranges from as low as 10% to as high as 45%. Having said this, there are also some other countries where the tax laws are a lot more relaxed as of now. This includes countries like Germany, Portugal, Singapore, Switzerland, Malta, Cyprus, Bermuda and of course El Salvador, which was the first country to accept Bitcoin as legal tender. So let's come back to India. Now the laws of a country recognize cryptocurrency gains as speculative gains, which makes them subject to a flat taxation of 30% along with applicable surcharge and a 4% cess. Further, the finance minister through her recent budget also introduced a TDS of 1% on all cryptocurrency transactions. <music> cryptocurrency crimes are on the rise and we are seeing many scams and frauds running into millions of dollars each week. The most common crypto scam is to create a bogus website featuring fake testimonials and a promise of massive and guaranteed returns. We saw something similar in India this year with Morris Coin, which turned out to be a 1,200 crore fraud. A second type of cryptocurrency frauds are virtual Ponzi schemes. This is where scamsters promote non-existent opportunities to invest in digital currencies and create the illusion of huge returns by paying off old investors with new investors' money. An Indian example of this was the Gain Bitcoin Ponzi scheme, which used a multi-level marketing scam and promised crypto investors a return of 10% per month for the next 18 months. Of course, this turned out to be a sham and in the process, the promoter seems to have cheated investors to the tune of 20,000 crores. A third scam and a very interesting one that we came across is what is commonly referred to as the romance scam. A romance scam is nothing but an online dating scam wherein tricksters persuade people they meet on dating apps or social media to give them virtual currencies on some pretext. 
scams like these might even sound a bit funny, but there are more and more frauds which are dotting the cryptocurrency landscape. For example, there is the cryptocurrency endorsement scam where some fraudster poses as a crypto billionaire and makes you invest in a get-rich-quick scheme. Then there are scamsters who pose as legitimate virtual currency traders or set up bogus crypto exchanges. There is of course the straightforward hacking of your crypto wallet from your mobile phone. And there's a new one now which involves converting retirement accounts in cryptocurrencies to make them safer and more tax efficient, both of which does not happen. So be careful with these elaborate schemes and to know more on how you can protect yourself from scams and frauds, do watch our video on the same topic on this YouTube channel. So we raised a few risks in earlier sections of this video. Firstly, there are frauds and scams which seem to be growing by the month and one has to be careful on how one is buying and storing their cryptos. Secondly, cryptocurrencies are not recognized all over the world. In fact, most countries don't recognize it, which means you can't be sure of it like you can be with gold or the US dollar. Thirdly, these virtual currencies come with massive price volatility and even a simple tweet by Elon Musk can be enough to nosedive the value of Bitcoin by over 30% in a single session. The fourth risk is that of liquidity or the lack of it, which is true for most cryptocurrencies that are not frequently traded. And yet another risk is the high cost of trading for some currencies, which is due to limited institutional participation and the lack of market makers. So to conclude, cryptocurrencies have their fair share of advantages and risks, and they also have their supporters and dissenters. But one thing we can all agree on is the importance of blockchain technology on which these cryptos are built and how it can revolutionize record keeping. Now investing in cryptocurrencies, whether one does it directly or through mutual funds, brokers or ETFs is a personal choice. But if you're keen, then do follow this quick crypto investing checklist our researchers have put together. Number one, research the cryptocurrency exchange you're using as there are dozens of them to choose from. Number two, understand how to securely store your digital currency. Thirdly, don't forget to diversify your crypto investments. Fourth, always be prepared for volatility. And point number five is since crypto investing is highly risky, invest only that part of your wealth that you can afford to lose. The point is this, cryptocurrencies is a rage right now, but the fact remains it is still in its relative infancy. It is highly speculative and is yet to be recognized by most countries around the world. So be prudent in your research, your emotions and your participation. And with this, we come to the end of this video. I sincerely hope you learned something new today and enjoyed this video as much as I enjoyed bringing it to you. Do subscribe to our channel, tap on that like button. Thank you for your time and I look forward to catching up with you next week on another interesting topic. Until then. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme-related documents carefully.